In an earlier video, I mentioned that I had written a script for a video on how women are impacted by artificial intelligence, and I decided to scrap it because I thought it was too depressing. This is that video. To be clear, it's not all bad. There are actually some interesting positive applications of AI systems for women. However, in my opinion, the bad stuff is pretty bad compared to the good stuff, which is why I was a little bit hesitant to do this topic. So we'll start with the bad stuff and then we'll end on a high note with the good stuff. In fact, if there are applications of AI that are primarily targeted at women that you found that I don't mention in this video, let me know about them in the comments. I'd love to learn about more good uses. Also, as a quick disclaimer, in this video we're talking about AI systems that primarily impact women. These systems may also have impacts on people who are transgender or non-binary, and there are also other systems that would definitely impact those people that wouldn't impact women as strongly. Some of these systems may also negatively impact men or people of color. The main point of this video is not to say that these systems only impact women or that women are the only population that we should be concerned about, but to say that these are some systems that negatively or positively impact women primarily. So chill in the comments. <laughs> to set the scene a bit, I think it's important to acknowledge that AI and machine learning as a field tend to be pretty male dominated. Women make up roughly 10% of the field. And as with many other fields with this sort of gender breakdown doing research that should be able to generalize to the wider population, I'm looking at you clinical trials, this means that the female perspective often isn't brought into the research and development process until the system has already gone public and has already started to impact people. The first interesting example of this actually goes back to the 70s, and thanks to Cassie on Twitter for making me aware of this, I'd seen this photo many times, but I didn't know the story behind it. Researchers at the University of Southern California were doing research on image processing, so actually not working in machine learning yet and they wanted an image that they could use to test a new method for a conference paper that they were publishing. Luckily, one of the engineers had a Playboy magazine on his desk because this was 1970 and that was still an okay thing to do. They found this picture, scanned it from the top down to her shoulders, and used it in their conference paper. The woman in this image is Swedish model Lena Soderberg, and her picture would go on to become the default test image for image processing. It would also go on to become one of the default test images for artificial intelligence research as image processing and machine learning started to mesh together. It's commonly referred to as the Lena. And interestingly, as the image gained more notoriety and was more commonly used, Soderbergh was actually invited to many image processing conferences and actually chaired a best paper award ceremony. Researchers in this field defended the use of this picture by pointing out that it is an example of an image that has a lot of shading, detail, and texture, which were all things that they were trying to test methods on to see if you could make a method that worked on all of those different things in one image. However, many of these researchers also acknowledged that this image gained traction largely because it's a picture of a woman from a Playboy magazine in a male-dominated field. It's not like good test images from the 70s could only be found in Playboy magazine. I'm sure they could have used something else. Since about 2000, the field has begun to move away from using this image in the test set, with many journals actually refusing to look at articles that use this image as their test. So how has this image impacted how women interact with AI systems? Well, there's no evidence that this image has changed the way we develop these systems at the code level. But many male and female researchers have pointed out that using images like this inherently alienate women who are interested in entering the field. So while Lena may not have changed the way that we write algorithms, the image has changed who writes those algorithms and what they're considering when they do so contributing to the development of AI systems without considering how they might affect women. And this brings us to our second topic, deepfakes. So we've discussed deepfakes in other videos, which I'll link above, but in short, deepfakes are videos that are generated using AI algorithms where the original face in the video is swapped with another one. The original concern around the malicious use of deepfakes was actually in political use. If you were able to create a fake video of a politician saying something inflammatory, 
you might be able to start a war without leaving your house. However, we actually haven't seen that play out. Political deepfakes have been few and far between, many of them being of fairly low quality, and they've been brushed aside by both the media and the public. Granted, this may change in the future as the technology improves. What we have seen is deepfakes used for revenge porn. Traditionally, revenge porn is the distribution of sexually explicit materials, usually images or videos, of a person without their consent. These images are often acquired consensually during relationships and are shared after a bad breakup where one person feels that they have been wronged. While both men and women can be affected by revenge porn, the overwhelming majority of revenge porn is disseminated by men and is of women. Deepfakes have augmented this issue by creating a way to create revenge porn without actually having to have any sexually explicit images or videos of the person that you're planning to target. Samantha Cole, a reporter for Vice who writes about the intersection of sex and technology, has written extensively on the topic of deepfakes for revenge porn. We've seen apps like Deep Nude, where users could take any image of a woman and turn it into a nude photo, as well as more involved video generation, where people would take pornographic videos and swap out the faces of the person that they're planning to target sharing that video on the internet as a sex tape. Celebrities have been a high-profile target of this technique, but most of the videos are actually of normal women, created by someone who feels that they've been wronged by them. The situation is not helped by the fact that creating these videos is fairly cheap and easy, as we saw in my Deepfix 101 video where I was able to create a deepfake in about a day for about $10. More recently, people have been creating deepfake revenge porn that consists of 3D avatars that you can interact with in virtual reality settings and manipulate in any way you want, which is horrific. Several states in the U.S. are considering legislation that makes it possible to prosecute people who create and disseminate deepfake revenge porn, with Virginia and California adding deepfakes to their existing revenge porn laws. China has outright banned the publication and dissemination of deepfakes, revenge porn or otherwise. Okay, we're almost done with the depressing part. The last thing I want to talk about is AI-based personal assistants. These systems, such as Siri, Alexa, and Cortana, are typically female by default. Research from the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, published earlier this year, has shown that the female defaults for these personal assistants and the responses that they give to gender abuse reinforce gender biases against women. The title of the report, I'd blush if I could, is actually a response that Siri gave when prompted with, hey Siri, you're a bitch. Traditional catcalls were often met with similarly demure responses. Overall, the report highlights that these systems teach people to equate women with subservient roles, such as secretaries and assistants, and the more this happens, the more that women will be penalized for not fitting into those roles in real life. As of mid-2019, many of these systems have been updated to provide more neutral responses to gender abuse. As you can see here. Hey Siri, you're a bitch. I won't respond to that. They are still female by default. Siri can be changed to a different voice, but Alexa and Cortana cannot. Okay, so what's the upshot to all of this? Well, the number of women who are entering careers in fields such as AI and computer science is actually increasing. Programs like Girls Who Code and Teens in AI encourage young women to pursue their interests in computational sciences and provide them with both educational opportunities and mentorship from other women in the field. Additionally, one of the largest AI conferences in the world, Neural Information Processing Systems, recently changed their acronym from NIPS to NeurIPS after a female-led campaign against the original acronym and the sexist rhetoric that was often used at the conference. One t-shirt from a few years ago said, my NIPS are NP hard. We've talked about how algorithms can amplify our human and societal biases, and that's also true for women. In fact, we recently discussed how credit algorithms are likely biased against women due to our history of not giving women lines of credit. The good news is that there's been a bunch of research on how we can make these algorithms more fair, and it seems like it will actually be very possible to do so. There are also some fun everyday applications. Many period tracking apps use AI to predict when you're going to get your period next, which is a blessing. Similarly, there are ovulation tracking apps that can help you get pregnant. Also, the outfit generator from Clueless is a real thing, which is pretty sweet. If you are a woman of any age and would like to get involved in AI research, there are many, many resources available for you to do so. I would start by, of course, checking out my video on how to learn AI for free, which I'll include up here. 
but I'd also check out programs like Girls Who Code and Teens in AI if you're a teen, as they provide awesome resources and mentorship for anyone interested in the field. Finally, I would look at meetup.com to see if there's any like women in AI or data science or computation groups, because I've personally found that there are a ton of them in Boston, and it's a really great way to meet other people who are already in the field, to make new friends, to learn about new career paths, and to network with other people in the computational sciences. But that's what I've got for you guys today. Again, if you have any positive applications of AI that you'd like to see me cover, you should definitely let me know in the comments section. If there's anything confusing or something that you didn't get in this video, you should also let me know in the comments and I can address it in my next peer review, which will probably come out next week. Otherwise, if you like this video, you can let me know by smashing that like button and subscribing to my channel. You can also support me on Patreon. Thank you so much to all of my patrons. And otherwise, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.